Today we'll see an aspect of U2's history that is not talked about very much, possibly because the band, understandably, doesn't really want to revive the matter. It was a time when they struggled to find their own voice, both musically and spiritually. A time when they risked losing their record contract. The two almost broke up when Bono, The Edge and Larry Mullen Jr. almost left music altogether. But this story has a hero. Enter Chris Blackwell. What did he do? And who is this Chris Blackwell, anyhow? Hello, Top Potters. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master's degree in music and an eye to find heroes when they're needed most. Not everyone knows that U2 actually had another record deal before signing up with Island. It was a demo deal with CBS signed in 1979. This produced an extremely rare three-track demo EP, U2 3. U2 3 went really well. All of his numbered 1,000 copies sold within days of its release. But CBS suits weren't sure U2 had the grit to make it outside Ireland. When the band's parents financed a short stay in London in December 1979, U2 didn't make much of an impression. In addition, CBS didn't particularly like drummer Larry Mullen Jr. Perhaps it was time to drop his four paddies. On the 26th of February 1980, CBS decided to release U2's first single, Another Day. That evening, the band played Dublin's National Stadium. U2, in a characteristically bold move, had booked a boxing venue for the finale of a short tour. It was quite a flop. 2,500 seats and only 1,000 people showing up. And yet, that performance won U2 their first real contract. Nick Stewart, from Island Records, was in attendance. Stewart met the band in the dressing room and offered them a contract. U2 accepted. To be honest, they would have probably accepted any recording contract but this was Island, the label that had launched Bob Marley, a big influence on the band. A label who had a reputation to listen to their artists and leave them a greater degree of control. What a thrill! Sorry CBS, you lost this train. 1981 was a bad year for Island Records. Bob Marley, their top star, died of cancer that year. Ireland was left in a bad financial shape due to the loss of future revenue that came with Marley's death. Ireland's next hope was U2. If they could deliver a convincing follow-up to their excellent debut album, boy! But 1981 was a bad year for U2 as well. Their second LP, October, was a mixed bag. It reflected a troubled time for the band. Bono, Larry Mullen and The Edge had got involved with a Christian group called Shalom Fellowship. They started to doubt their fate could mix with a rock and roll life. In the end, you 2 decided to go on, but October's poor sales had repercussions. They were now playing in smaller venues, especially in the key market of the United States and things didn't go better in 1982. The band's single, A Celebration, was a letdown in the charts. Island executives weren't pleased. But they weren't as displeased with you too as I will be with you if you're enjoying this video and don't hit that like button right now. Just kidding, but like and subscribe to the channel. I could go on and on about how your subscription will help me to produce more and better videos, but that would slow down the video just when I'm about to drop a huge behind the scene bomb. So, you know, support this channel if you can. Thank you.
In early 1983, Island Records boss Chris Blackwell, now you know who this Chris Blackwell is, Island Records boss Chris Blackwell received the memo, the artist and repertoire at Island wanted to drop you too. <laughs> They were not selling enough to recoup their advances. Their future didn't look too promising. Blackwell's OK was needed to terminate the contract. Technically, U2 had still two albums or two years before their contract expired. Blackwell rejected the memo. U2 were not to leave Ireland. End of the story. In today's music business, a record executive that nurtures a band like that is unheard of. The music biz might indeed have been a bit different back then, but I think I was exaggerating when I called Blackwell a hero. I mean, he was, in a sense. But he wasn't just a generous pattern of the arts allowing four youngsters to take their time to flourish. I think he actually took a cold-headed business decision there. Island had lost its star when Bob Marley had died. A global star brings in a lot of money for a label. For all their impressive rooster, Island still had to look at you too for their biggest hope to get their next global star. Their music managed to bridge the gap between new listeners and older music lovers. These four kids had big ideas. Even when they flopped with October, they had a larger-than-life outlook, an urgency in what they did. You two knew how to move on a stage, and they knew how to deal with the press. This was a hard-working band with a dedicated fan base. Imagine you had been in Chris Blackwell's shoes. If you had dropped you two, Ireland would have not risked losing even more money. But you would have taken a sure loss, passing on a band that still had potential. What would you have done? In a simple game theory exercise, Blackwell decided to keep you two on board. Did his gamble pay off? It did. U2's next album, War, sold well. More importantly, the band regained all the ground they had lost in the States. Their war tour started in theaters and ended up in arenas. But that wasn't enough. U2 were going to make a much bigger noise with their next studio album. By the time their contract with the island came to an end in early 1984, you two were courted by every label out there, especially CBS. Perhaps you two recalled that Blackwell had put his trust in them just one year earlier. Perhaps they felt they were talking with someone who was listening to their requests and ideas. Whatever the case, you two decided to sign a new contract with Island. With a substantially smaller advance than what they would have received going elsewhere, but with higher royalties on albums sold, and more money to promote their music and tours. Most significantly, U2 got back their publishing rights. I think this was the one reason for the band to sign with Island again. If they had kept delivering good music, the new contract would have paid increased dividends. And deliver they did with the unforgettable fire. And then, in 1985, during the Live Aid... But wait, I've already talked about that. Check the description for a link to that video and more. Well, my dear Top Potters, this was a story that ended well. Island got richer. You too got richer. Everyone ended up happier. Time to close this video then. This was Simon Mas. Remember to keep an eye on this channel for further music-related content or, for your convenience, check out my Telegram channel with music-related suggestions and a monthly recap of my activities in music storytelling. Click on the link in the description or use this QR code. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hats on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love!